Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, the novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 2 As the afternoon went on, the sun started its slow journey across the sky and down below the horizon. Tina watched morosely from her bedroom window as the rest of the partygoers began to pull up in various cars. The first caravan that came sputtering down the road into the clearing was a big blue four-door van. An African-American couple in bright clothing, clearly city-dwelling kids, climbed out and laughed, groping each other playfully. Two more girls and another guy climbed out of the back, and Tina saw the copious marijuana smoke pouring from the windows. She felt the bitterness clench tightly around her heart. They all seemed so happy, so normal, free of their problems, free to enjoy life. Tina didn't have that luxury. Another car came down the winding path and stopped next to the van. A tall, slender, dark-haired guy in an expensive dress shirt came out of the driver's side, and one of the blonde girls that had been sunbathing came running out of the house and leaped into his arms. As everyone else went inside, the two of them and the African-American couple climbed into the van. It was just your average group of college students having a fun weekend, and Tina wasn't a part of them. She never would be. She never would be normal. Her thoughts began to race, and then she took a deep breath, something she learned at the hospital. She could still see those austere gray walls surrounding her. She could still hear the psychotic ramblings of her fellow patients in her mind. It was all coming back. Thank God, she thought. Thank God I am out of that hospital. But now she was here, where it all came crashing down around her. She felt a sense of calmness rush over her after a few more slow, deep breaths, and then she looked around at her childhood bedroom wistfully. Her bed was still adorned with her favorite white frilly blanket. Her dolls were still lying in a corner next to her rustic old dollhouse. It was like nothing changed. Some of the paintings on the wall were crooked after all the years that the house went unoccupied, and she quickly fixed them trying desperately to find something for her mind to grab onto. At least she could control that. The rest of her life was totally out of control, but fixing the paintings gave her some kind of ethereal sense of control. It was all about control, Dr. Cruz had said. Control your urges, he said. Control your feelings. She had tried to tell him that it wasn't that simple, but he didn't believe her. Nobody believed her about anything. Every time she would tell her mother the truth, she would get this suspicious look in her eye. What was worse is that the feelings just came over her randomly, with no warning. And before she knew it, 
things were catching on fire and moving by themselves. There was no control. She couldn't control when or where it happened. It just did. It had to be something supernatural, some kind of curse, the curse of Crystal Lake. There had to be something she had overlooked. She sat down on the edge of her bed and started pouring through her mind again, just like she had done many times before. She had racked her brain for years, trying to understand what had happened and why it kept happening. Maybe she was one of those people that God blessed with a special gift, and maybe she could learn how to use it for good. But it wasn't working out too well, since she didn't know how to control it. She couldn't control it no matter what she did. No matter how hard she tried, no matter how hard she concentrated on certain objects that Dr. Cruz had placed in front of her, she couldn't make them move. But then, at school and at home, she'd find herself shocked at the things that would happen. Lights flickering in the bathroom for only her, doors moving, seeing ghastly images of strange, distorted people from seemingly foreign realms. Tina, you know you can do this, the doctor would say. He would even accuse her of deliberately not trying. The thing was, she didn't exactly know who else to trust except Dr. Cruz, but something in the back of her mind told her that, to him, she was just another guinea pig. She was his ticket to success, and she knew it. She just had to hold on to hope that he was looking out for her best interest. If only she could control it. It was ruining her social life. How could she have a job in the future if her accidents continued to happen? How was she going to meet someone and have a normal life? All Tina could do was to wait and see what would happen. One thing kept gnawing at her, something she couldn't ignore. She kept thinking to herself, If I can make things move and catch on fire, what else can I do? Ben Johnson, a tall, muscular African-American jock of a guy, lit up a freshly rolled joint and inhaled deep. So your uncle owns this place, he asked Russell Winthrop, who was sitting back against the back doors of the blue van that was now filled with thick smoke. Yeah, Russell said. He was totally cool with us coming out and using it for Mike's birthday, as long as the whole place doesn't smell like weed. Kate, Ben's girlfriend, a young African-American, doe-eyed college freshman, took the joint from Ben and took a drag. Like your rich parents don't smoke weed, Kate remarked. Well, they do, but they hate it when I do it, Russell said. He was dressed just like you'd imagine a rich boy to dress like. He wore a plaid dress shirt and khaki shorts, and his dark, curly hair was neatly styled and gelled with hair styling paste. Russell's girlfriend, Sandra, a slightly husky yet still very pretty blonde, took the joint next and inhaled the hazy, odorous smoke. So when is Mikey supposed to show? she asked the group. He's supposed to be here any second now, Ben replied. Sandra took another drag and then turned to Ben. So, um, this is a nice van, she said. Lots of room in the back. She winked at Russell. Well, you guys are welcome to use it. After all, it's the least I can do since Russell's letting us all use his family's cabin. Sweet, Russell said, and took the joint from his girlfriend. Russell took a hit and inhaled deep, coughing afterwards. He was clearly not an experienced smoker, and he started coughing even more. <coughs> Shit, he exclaimed as the group laughed. We might as well take the van to sleep in, Sandra suggested. Are there even enough rooms for everyone? Kate inquired. <laughs> oh yeah, there's plenty of room, Russell said, still coughing intermittently. <coughs> if, if it gets too cramped, there's always the tool shed out back. Anyone care for a roll around in the hay? He kissed Sandra's neck and she giggled. 
I thought I saw that old thing when we pulled in, Ben said. Why do you have hay? <laughs> My parents always were wanting to have a couple of chickens or horses out here, but they just never got around to it, Russell explained, coughing raucously. Oh, rich boy's gonna get smoked out. Kate teased, as Ben toyed affectionately with her jet black hair that was tied in a long braid. Just then there was a rapping on the door, and Russell jumped out of his skin. The group stared at each other apprehensively. Then the doors were jolted open. It was Melissa, her face mad with determination, and changed into a stark white blouse and capri pants. A pearl necklace and several expensive diamond bracelets embellished her. Have you guys seen Neck? Melissa said, crinkling up her nose in disgust at the herbal smell of marijuana. I think he's down by the lake, Sandra replied. Thanks, Melissa said, and strolled towards the water. Surely enough, there was Nick Rogers standing at the shore of the lake that shimmered in the afternoon sun. He looked like a rugged cowboy from a western in his newly changed party clothes, a full denim get-up, complete with jeans and a jean jacket that was lined with thick wool. Melissa was captivated. He threw pebbles absent-mindedly into the water and gazed out at the coniferous wilderness. Why aren't you inside with the others? Melissa asked as she approached him. Nick turned to her and smiled sheepishly, running his hands through his hair. He was deeply aware of Melissa's fondness for him. Then again, she wasn't too good at hiding it. Uh, I guess these really are Mike's friends, not mine, he replied. Melissa pursed her lips and walked up beside him, staring at the muscles that rippled underneath his outfit. You know, it is a party after all. You could get to know some of us, she said, trying not to make her attraction towards him too obvious. Her two buttons at the top of her blouse were strangely unbuttoned, and Nick knew why. I guess so, he said, making an effort not to stare at her open blouse in an effort to hint to her that he wasn't interested. He was much too preoccupied with someone else. So, what's your major? Melissa asked. She wasn't interested in that question, but she asked anyway to try and start a conversation. Psychology, Nick said. I think it's a fascinating subject. If Nick had more confidence, he would have told her how obvious she was being with her flirting. Psychology was what helped him notice subtle things like that, such as changes in body language. He also noticed all of her expensive makeup, false eyelashes, and designer clothes, and he wondered who she was trying to impress. If it was himself, she wasn't doing a good job. Nick wasn't impressed by designer clothes. He was impressed by character. It was how he had noticed Tina, and how different she seemed to be from other girls he had met. He couldn't stop thinking about her eyes, and how sad they were. He wanted to know more. He wanted to know everything about her. But considering he had just mortally embarrassed her, he didn't feel like it was going well. There was something definitely alluring about her. It was the mystery that intrigued him the most. Why had she freaked out on him like that? Why was she out here with seemingly her parents? Family vacation? If that couple wasn't her folks, then who were they? Psychology, huh? So can you psychoanalyze me? Melissa asked flirtatiously. I don't know, <laughs> he said, laughing nervously. Maybe, uh, once I get through grad school? Melissa faked laughter and then glanced back at the cabin. Well, I'm going to go grab a drink and mingle. Care to join? Nick followed Melissa reluctantly up the hill towards the cabin, and they both went into the kitchen through the back door. The kitchen and living area of the rental home were side by side, connected by a pair of sliding doors. The kitchen was old-fashioned with pots and pans hanging from a large rack above the kitchen island. Knick-knacks were scattered all about the living room and a large stone fireplace made for a nice centerpiece. A staircase by the front door led up to the second floor. Two girls were standing in the kitchen and smiled at Melissa and Nick. Robin Lancaster was the taller of the two. 
She was someone that Ben and Kate must have invited, Melissa thought. Robin was drop-dead beautiful. She was a stunning, vivacious redhead with a perky chest accentuated by a low-cut maroon top. Her friend, Maddie Paulson, was shorter and mousier, with wire-rimmed glasses and thick blonde hair. She wore a sweater and jeans and looked very plain and ordinary. What is a bookish girl like that doing at a college party? Melissa wondered. She must have been invited out of pity. This was totally not her scene, she thought. She was short and chubby, and her blonde hair was up in pigtails. What a dweeb, Melissa thought nastily. But she wasn't nearly as much of a dweeb as Eddie. Her eyes scanned the room until she found him, one of Mike's old roommates, Eddie Hassel. He was geeking out to Robin and Maddie now about writing fan fiction, and Robin looked as if she might die of boredom. Melissa scanned the room, studying everyone for their weaknesses to use against them. David Foster, another friend of Ben and Kate's, was the most attractive guy there, besides Nick, Melissa decided. He was kind of scrawny, but he was attractive in a preppy, rich boy kind of way. He wore a plaid button-up and tight-fitting jeans, and his dark hair was slicked back. Melissa thought about hooking up with him, but he seemed to be really attracted to Robin from the way he was looking at her. That only left Nick. Everyone else was taken. Melissa knew that she'd have him before their weekend excursion was over. If only he wasn't so preoccupied with that girl next door, she thought. She looked over at him, noticing the distracted way he shuffled his feet and the way he kept staring out the window. Maybe he was just worried about his cousin. After all, Mike was supposed to show a little bit after the others did, and an hour had passed with no word from him or his girlfriend Jane. Night was falling, and Melissa started to worry too. But knowing Mike, he probably had gotten lost. So, when do you think Mike will be here? Melissa asked, pouring herself a glass of wine. Nick ran his hands through his hair and chuckled. He'll be here. Uh, he wouldn't miss his own party, Nick said. He probably had some car trouble. He drives a real clunker. Ah, Melissa responded, feigning interest. Melissa surveyed the room of party people once again, studying them all and deciding which one of them would be a threat to her and Nick's inevitable passionate love affair. Robin was probably her only other competition. Her breasts were larger, Melissa thought. Much larger. David seemed to have taken an interest in her and was now flirting with her in the kitchen. Maddie stood nearby, fixing her hair in the mirror. Poor thing, Melissa muttered under her breath. Somebody definitely invited her just out of politeness, Melissa thought cattily. Maybe all of them would run off together and leave Melissa and Nick to do whatever they wanted, or rather for Melissa to do whatever she wanted with Nick. Ben and Kate snuggled in an armchair while Eddie was rambling on about Star Trek. They weren't listening. There were two missing, Russell and Sandra. Melissa began to wonder where they were. The blue van that was parked outside the rental cabin rocked back and forth to the beat of an 80s rock song. Sandra and Russell were high. They rolled around in the back of the van on top of a small mattress that was set up on the floorboard, naked, kissing each other as Sandra giggled. The sex had been even better now that they were stoned. If you looked at them side by side, you'd never know they were a couple. Sandra was far from an average-looking girl, but Russell looked fairly ordinary. It was the money that kept them together like glue, and Russell had plenty of it. As the afternoon sun bathed the couple in a warm glow, they rolled out of each other, catching their breath. Sandra snuggled next to Russell stroking his chest. So, Russell said. Yeah, Sandra replied. If we're in my uncle's cabin for the weekend, why did you opt to sleep in the van? Sandra smiled slyly. Who says we'll be sleeping? She climbed back on top of him ferociously and kissed him hard. They had met at Russell's parents' country club a few years back. Both of them were college freshmen and hit it off immediately. Truthfully, it was the size of Russell's bank account and his hefty trust fund that pulled Sandra in. Mary Rich, her mother had always taught her, 
and that's what she planned on. Once her and Russell were actually married, they'd be set for life, and they were both ready for adulthood. They were done with school soon, and this weekend would be their last big chance to have some fun. And there would be lots of fun this weekend. They both knew it. Russell knew that Sandra wanted the money and didn't care. After all, she was hot, the sex was good, and he didn't have to work very hard to attain her or keep her happy. He got the sex while she got the money. It was a win-win for both of them. He kissed her back, running his fingers through her platinum blonde hair. I just know I'm not cleaning up you guys' mess before we leave, he said, as she rolled off him and started lighting another joint. I just know I'm not cleaning up you guys' mess before we leave, he said, as she rolled off of him and started lighting another joint. I swear, I won't touch a thing, she said, holding up her hands in mock terror. Come here, you, Russell said, and leaped on her again, lip-locking with her in a passionate kiss. Back inside the rental cabin, Melissa stood away from the others, observing the party. Everyone seemed to be getting along just fine. Maddie was now trying to inject herself unwantedly into every conversation. Robin and David sat on the couch, listening and trying their best not to laugh derisively at Eddie's diatribe about how Star Trek was now ruined by the sequels. Ben and Kate now sat on the staircase. Kate's head rested on Ben's shoulder. It was one to remember. If only those neighbors hadn't shown up. They seemed like the uptight type. Like they might try to call the cops if they got too rowdy. Other than that, there was surely nothing that would ruin this party. After all, it was summer. Summer at Crystal Lake. Nighttime slowly crept over the heavily wooded area, and the lights from inside the party cabin shone brightly, illuminating the darkness that surrounded it. The lake was stone still, and the wind was not whipping the trees. It was like looking at a painting, a snapshot frozen in time, the peace before the chaos. The reeds thrashed gently in the warm summer breeze. Crickets and other nocturnal animals started to make their presence known. The long dirt road leading back into town and into civilization had remained inactive all night. There was no sign of Mike or his girlfriend, and it looked like they weren't going to show. So they all decided to party anyway. The Shepherd house was all quiet. Two lights were on upstairs, one in Mrs. Shepherd's room and one in an office space. Inside Tina's father's office, Tina looked around at the room at what Dr. Cruz had done to it. He had taken over her father's old mahogany desk and covered it with stacks of files and other papers. In the middle of the room was a table and a chair, next to a video camera on a tripod pointed straight at the table. On the table was a matchbook and a tape recorder. It now looked like one of those depressingly austere interrogation rooms in a police station. Dr. Cruz paced the room, thinking deeply as he always did. It was time for another one of their sessions, and Tina was not up for it. She had just been filled with all the memories that had been locked up in this house, and she just felt like crawling into bed. Sleep was the only way to make her mind just shut up for a while. Do we really have to do this now? Tina asked him. He thought for another moment as if he hadn't even heard what she said, and then he looked up at her. The expression on his face was one of pure, quizzical interest. He was still deep in his thoughts and, indeed, hadn't heard a word she had said. Tina, you're late. Have a seat, please, he said. Tina scowled at him distrustingly. Why won't they listen, she thought. They never listened. Reluctantly, Tina shuffled over to the chair and sat down at the table. Dr. Cruz picked up a file from the desk and rifled through it. He then set it down and started fidgeting with the camera, making sure that it was positioned perfectly. Tina watched him, wondering what he was thinking. 
She knew what she was thinking. She wanted answers from this man, instead of more therapy. Why am I seeing things? she asked. I don't know, Tina, he said, not looking up from the video camera. Why do you think you're seeing things? Tina looked down at the table in silence. God damn it, she thought. More questions instead of answers. She felt like she was in a police interrogation instead of a therapist session. Tina glanced back at the big, expensive video camera that was aimed at her face. Is that really necessary? She inquired, gesturing to the camera. Dr. Cruz's head turned to her quickly, almost surprised by her question. Oh, the camera? I just want to keep track of our progress, he replied. Now, he said in a more serious tone, let's get back to work. He turned his attention away from the camera and back to Tina. You see that matchbook? He asked her. I want you to concentrate on it. Think about your feelings and focus them on the matchbook. Maybe we can get it to move. He stood back with his hands in his pockets to give Tina some space. And then she started to stare down at the matchbook intently. He turned on the tape recorder and watched. The matchbook wasn't budging. Tina stared at it for several more seconds, concentrating hard enough to make the muscles in her face sore. You're not trying, Tina, Dr. Cruz declared. Yes, I am, Tina protested. Her face started to turn red. Think about it moving and make it move, he demanded of her. She stared harder, but still nothing happened. Finally, she released a heavy sigh and threw her hands up. I can't, she cried. I've told you a million times. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Dr. Cruz raised his voice angrily. You're lying to me! It almost startled her. He had never spoken that way to her before. She felt tears surfacing as she glared at him with pleading eyes. You're lying, Tina, because you know that these things happen when your emotions are at their peak, he said. Now concentrate, Tina. Concentrate, he urged her. Tina stared back down at the matchbook as she felt the surge of emotions rising in her, like lava threatening to erupt from the mouth of the swirling volcano inside her. She fought the tears that welled up in her eyes, staring down and focusing as much as she could on the matchbook. Maybe if she finally did it for him, he would leave her alone. Then she felt it come over her like a storm cloud. She felt all of her anger at him focus in like a laser beam on the single matchbook lying in front of her. It still wouldn't move. She pictured Dr. Cruz instead of the matchbook. Visions of Dr. Cruz being thrown into the wall raced through her mind. She pictured him being the one to catch on fire. She could hear his screams of agony. And then the matchbook fluttered across the table before their very eyes. Tina's eyes flickered across the table, and the matchbook suddenly moved again, following her gaze. Then Tina released feeling her muscles relax as tears started flowing. The feelings washed over as quickly as they had appeared. Dr. Cruz looked on in amazement. He blinked, trying to make sure what he had seen wasn't just a trick of the light. No, he thought, it can't be. She actually had done it. Tina's eyes were widening at the realization that she had made it happen. She could control it. She looked at him, he lowered his voice. Now, he said, what did you do? What went through your mind? Tina swallowed hard, hesitant to tell him the truth. I, I was thinking about you, she said. Dr. Cruz raised his eyebrows and chuckled, taken aback for a second. Look, I don't know how any of this is going to help me, Tina said. Dr. Cruz shook his head thinking. Your psychokinetic abilities seem to be a projection of the suppressed guilt that you have. Tina threw her hands up to her head in frustration. Would you speak English? She cried, pushing away from the table in anger and scraping the old wooden legs of the chair against the sagging wooden floor. You're more interested in this telekinetic stuff than you are in me, she said with an accusatory tone. 
Dr. Cruz wagged a finger at her sternly, like he was scolding a child. That is not true, Tina, he exclaimed. The only reason I am here is to help you overcome the guilt you feel about your father's death. Tina felt it again, that same rush of rage, the same visions of Dr. Cruz suddenly bursting into flames and screaming in agony flooded her mind. That's bullshit, she screamed, and then without warning, the matches in the matchbook suddenly were lit ablaze by a fire that came out of nowhere. The flames rose high, grasping at Tina as she jumped backwards in absolute shock. They both watched in silent awe as the flames slowly burnt out. Without saying another word, Tina ran from the room in tears. Dr. Cruz kept his eye on the now smoldering matchbook that had been burnt to a crisp. He inhaled the woody smell of the matches to make sure what he had seen was real and that they were really burning. Then, he looked back towards the open door and muttered something to himself. I rest my case. Tina slammed through the door of her bedroom, fighting back the emotional meltdown that was threatening to come spewing out of her. The tears in her eyes stung and she tasted their saltiness on her lips. What an awful man, she thought. She knew exactly what he was doing now. She wished she never would have come out here. She almost wished she was back in that quiet room at the hospital, where there was nothing but four white walls to stare at, nothing but peace and quiet, four solid concrete walls that would effectively keep out the world. There she'd truly be safe. She wished everything would stop going so fast. She felt like the room was spinning, and she sat down on the bed to try and ground herself. In. Out. She took deep gulps of air, trying not to panic. You're okay, Tina, she said to herself. You're okay. That awful Dr. Cruz was going to make her go even crazier than she already was. He was just trying to rile her up because they both knew that her strange abilities flared up whenever she was under duress. Now it was going to be a process of him making her cry over and over again so he could record her telekinesis, as he called it. She wished he would just speak to her like a human being instead of her doctor. She didn't need any more doctors. She needed someone to take her away from the abject insanity that was her life. God, just take me away from my life, she prayed. Her life was unfolding in front of her like some sick, sad, mythical tragedy. And Tina was the star, the damsel in distress. Not anymore, she thought. She was going to get to the bottom of things. She was going to learn to control whatever this was and figure out how to stop it, even if it meant dying while trying. She didn't care anymore. Her daddy was dead and there wasn't anything she could do about it. What did she have to lose? Not a damn thing. Not a damn thing, she thought. Not anymore. She couldn't believe her mother had stuck with her for all these years and dealt with all her trauma. No, I can't die. She thought it wasn't an option. She wasn't about to leave that poor woman alone. Tina was all that Mrs. Shepherd had left. She had to figure this out in one way or another. If Dr. Cruz wasn't going to help her, then she had to help herself. Tina started to relax as she felt the huge, encumbering and overpowering emotions slowly subside. Then she saw the framed photo of her father on the wall. He was wearing his favorite fishing hat and smiling from ear to ear. She felt the tears coming again, hot, burning in her eyes. She felt her face flush, and she brought her hand up to her mouth as the tears fell freely. Daddy, I'm so sorry, she thought. The helplessness was overwhelming. There was nothing she could have done to save him. And it was her fault. It was all her fault. 
If she wouldn't have gone out in that canoe. If she only wouldn't have said those words. I hate you. I wish you were dead. They echoed in her mind. Maybe Dr. Cruz was right. Maybe it was all just suppressed guilt and she really was out of her mind. She didn't know anymore. Everything was so confusing and she wanted to just shut her eyes and pretend she didn't exist. She wanted to crawl into a hole and never have to engage with life again. Her world was quickly spinning out of control. What was next? Would she set the house on fire? Would she hurt someone or worse? All of a sudden, a hand gingerly touched her shoulder and Tina leapt out of her skin. It's me, honey, it's mom, Mrs. Shepherd said, consoling her. Are you all right? Tina sobbed into her mother's arms. Mom, I miss him so much, she wailed. Mrs. Shepherd sighed and rubbed her daughter's shoulder, trying to comfort her. I know, I miss him too. Her voice trailed off as Dr. Cruz entered the room. Tina glared at him, and then as more tears began to surface, she ran from the room. Tina! Mrs. Shepherd called after her. It was no use. Tina was already scrambling down the stairs. She threw open the door and rushed out onto the covered porch in the warm summer air and stopped to take a breath. She had to get away somehow. She had to get as far as she could away from this dreadful place. Then she froze suddenly. That was the same exact thing she had thought the night her father was killed. All she had wanted to do was to get as far away as possible. And that's why she went out on the canoe in the lake. If she hadn't done that, her father wouldn't have come out onto the rickety pier. It never would have happened if she hadn't followed those urges she had to run away from it all to escape. No more running, she thought. She couldn't run from it anymore. She had to face this thing head on. No matter what it took, Tina had to solve the mystery of Crystal Lake. She started down the porch steps and started walking through the yard towards the lake. She kept her eyes straight ahead, determined to make it to the lake. That was the only place she thought she could go. Back to where it all happened, Crystal Lake. She didn't dare look at that rental cabin. The college kids didn't matter right now. Nothing else mattered except figuring out why this was happening to her. She stared ahead, not even blinking. No more tears fell. They had stopped when she became determined to fight this. If nobody else was going to help her, she had to do it herself. As she walked, the nocturnal animals rustling in the fallen leaves and crickets chirping accompanied her slow, silent walk as she looked out at the water. Her eyes were transfixed on the shimmer of the full moon's reflection on the placid surface of the lake. She strolled out onto the rebuilt dock and stopped at the edge to catch her breath from her brisk walk. She closed her eyes, remembering how it had felt on that night eight years ago. The air had been warm and still, just like it was now. The crickets and cicadas had been singing. Everything seemed so quiet and ordinary until it had happened. She never saw it coming. The snapping of the pier support beams, the splash, her father's petrified scream. It all came back to her in a rush as the summer breeze brushed her face and hair. And now the lake looked as still as ever, as if nothing had ever happened. But her mind was seeing it all in her heart. Tina! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to! Her father's voice reverberated around in her mind. Then she heard the sound of her own voice. I hate you, I wish you were dead! It all came back to her. The crystal clear snapping sound of the wooden beams that supported the pier made before it fell apart seemed to ricochet all around her as if it were happening again in this moment. She heard her own scream as she watched her father tumble into the water in a free fall as the boards under his feet fell out from beneath him. No, Daddy, no! I'm sorry, Dad. I wish I could bring you back. Tina said, staring out at the water. Then she remembered how her goldfish came back to life. Maybe it was finally time to see what her powers could do. 
she was feeling all the emotions, and if she just focused them on the water, maybe she could actually bring him back. After all, she just watched herself light a matchbook on fire. What did she have to lose? Tina got on both of her knees and closed her eyes, focusing intently on the lake and the memory of her father, just like she had done with the matchbook. She pictured him rising and rising from the muck of the lake bed until he finally could breathe oxygen again. Come back, Daddy, please. We miss you and need you, she silently wished with all of her might. Then she thought she felt a presence, something under the water. She saw bubbles rising to the surface. Oh my God, she thought. It was working. Daddy? She said aloud, scanning the surface of the lake fervently. What Tina didn't know was that a presence was awakening under the water. A dark, sinister presence. A rusty chain snapped. Bubbles violently rose to the surface as whoever was coming up from the depths began to breathe for the first time in years. Tina closed her eyes. Come back, Daddy. Please come back. She begged the universe. The tears kept streaming as she felt the emotions boiling just under the surface of her barely kept together composure. She felt him. She felt him coming up from the depths. She saw his heavy body rising and rising to the top in her mind. Then, a loud resounding splash jolted her out of her focusing. She opened her eyes and her jaw dropped in shock. What had risen up from the bottom of the lake was almost certainly not her father. It was someone else. Someone huge. Someone monstrous. She only got a quick glimpse of what appeared to be some kind of mask over his face, and then, emotionally exhausted and in shock at what she had done, Tina suddenly fainted and slipped down into a pit of endless darkness. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 2 of Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood by Landon Turner. Really enjoyed this uh, chapter tonight, enjoying the book so far. Like I said last time, Landon has his work cut out with him with this movie uh, novelization. There's so many characters, and most of them are so one-dimensional and just there for Jason to kill, obviously. But there is a deeper story here that I hope he, he dwells into more uh, than the movie did. Uh, he's already doing it. Uh, digging deeper into what Dr. Cruz is really up to, um, that he doesn't really care, you know, even though it kind of feels like sometimes he might. You know, at the end of the day, he doesn't. Digging deeper into the guilt that Tina's feeling about her dad. Deeper into how her powers actually work. And, you know, like I've said before about fan novelizations, I love it when the authors aren't afraid to take some creative liberties, original thinking with these movie novelizations, because that's what would happen with an actual novelization if it was, like, commissioned by the studio. The author would take creative liberties. And it's a fan novelization, which, in my opinion, Landon writes them just as good as Simon Hawk. And uh, I love when he takes those creative liberties. I love his, his work on bringing the movie uh, to book form, you know, directly movie to book, but uh, I also really appreciate when he takes those creative liberties, and I'm looking forward to seeing how he does that with this movie. Um, really hard character development in this because there's so many characters, and so many are just one-dimensional, but he's doing an amazing job, especially with Dr. Cruz, Tina, and her mom, and all the backstory with her dad. You know, and also with Melissa and Nick. I would say out of all of them, those two have more story in the movie than most of the other characters, uh, besides Tina and the Doctor and her mom. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen next. 
So happy that Jason is back from the depths. He's about to go on his rampage. And I uh, cannot wait to see what Landon does with the Tina versus Jason stuff. If he throws us a few curveballs there. Uh, really looking forward to that. I hope you are too. Uh, let me know what you thought of tonight's chapter. If you're excited about this book. And I'll be back very soon with more. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you so much. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Uh, if you wouldn't mind joining the Patreon or making a small donation to the channel through PayPal or Cash App or even ordering a $10 Cameo video, all these things help fund the channel since we can't monetize it, we depend on you. Have a great night, and we'll see you soon.